Welcome, loved ones. Welcome, new subscribers. Thank you, subscribers, for liking and sharing our videos. I am Reverend Penelope Stewart. You can follow Chemistry on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Today, I'm going to be doing a book review on Mama Wata, Africa's Ancient Goddess Unveiled, Volume 1. This book is 500 pages. It's packed with information. I mean, historical facts. Mama Zogby really did her footwork on documenting history. I mean, it's a phenomenal book. I recommend it. It is priceless. You should have it in your library. I only have the book on ebook. I don't think I pay. I probably pay maybe 20 bucks for it on ebook. But to buy it, I think it's between anywhere between 35 or 40 bucks. There is also a volume two. That book is over 40 bucks. It has over 700 pages. I intend on getting that book too, but I don't know if it's on ebook. But it, you know, I got it because it was less expensive on ebook. If you're interested in purchasing that book, I think I got mine from Lulu. Lulu had it as an ebook. And the information in this book is going to, you know, in this book review, it's going to be very sensitive, you know, but we're going to find out who Mama Wata is and more about the why they say the black woman is God. We're going to dig in really deep. This book, this book review really doesn't scratch the surface of of the book you know you have to get the book because it's it's packed with juicy information but i'm going to bring, bring some ju juicy information here to you today so we're going to be looking doing a book review with this book along with looking at a little bit of my research that i did with my book as well but the main focus is going to be this book. Now, for those of you that think this is feminism, you know, it's going to be sensitive to you. You know, I advise you to turn it off now because we're just going to be sticking to the facts and major art culture and, and history, you know, period. And there's really no such thing as feminism. I mean, is there any such thing as masculinism? You know, these are just made up terms. But let's just dive in deep and begin to do the book review. Let's dive in here. Now, the author, let's see what the author has to say about this book. She says, this history book that is meant to serve as a brief introduction and exploration into the ancient African matriarchal religious past. A crucial sacerdotal history that has been lost, stolen, and concealed for more than 2,000 years. It is an attempt to reclaim the long-forgotten traditions of Mami, Wata, and Voodoo as established by the ancient African ancestors. It is also an effort to reconstruct important vital aspects of black women's spiritual history by showing its indestructible cosmogenetic link in the families and general blood of the diaspora. Hopefully, this book, too, will shed much-needed clarity to commonly held misconceptions about black women and their rightful place as the original heirs and descendants of the world's first spiritual kingdoms and to encourage further critical examination of the authenticity and legitimacy of the so-called patriarchally construed world religions. This book is also intended to re-educate re to guide the diaspora of both men and women seeking to reestablish African traditional religions in their cosmologically correct feminine masculine complements, but are discouraged by unnatural, heavily patriarchal imbalance that exists today. The information in this book might aid as well in diminishing the ignorance and fear created by long-cherished stereotypes concerning Miami Wata and the Voodoo religion. Finally, this book is specially written 
to fill an embarrassing void in academia for those wanting to include the voodoo religion inclusive in an overall curriculum on world religions, women's studies, and black spirituality. For the new worshiper, researcher, student, and others, this book is deliberately loaded with academic references and an extensive bibliography to encourage further individual critical research and independent group and class study. Like I said, she's a very good author. This book is priceless. She's did some really good footwork too. Now let's dive in. Some of you are saying, what is a Mama Wata? I've never heard of Mama Wata. I've never heard of such a deity. So let's just dive in and find out what is Mama Wata. Mama Wata is a water deity venerated in West, Central, and Southern Africa and in the African diaspora in the Americas. Mama Wata spirits are usually female but are sometimes male. Mama Wata is often described as a mermaid-like figure with a woman's upper body, often nude, and the hind quarters of fish or serpent. The appearance of her hair ranges from straight curly to kinky and combs straight back. The deities existed in Africa long before colonization on the continent allowed English to inf infiltrate. The Miami Wata name in Ethiopia and Egyptian is or in origin and is linked in ancient African culture, spiritual belief systems, and folklore. In other tales, Miami Wata is fully human in appearance. The existence and spiritual importance of Miami Wata is deeply rooted in ancient tradition and mythology of the coastal southeastern Nigerians. Commonly thought to be a single entity, the term actually refers to the pantheon of the African water deities. These African cultures were matriarchal, and though Mama Wata can refer to males and females, they are most typically thought of as feminine and often take on female form in art. The Sibyl, sometimes called oracles, are prophetess of the Mama Wati. Many people are not aware of that the serpents and mermaids being related to the divine ancient mother, yet this depiction was popular in ancient era. Africa universal sacred totem is the serpent, specifically the cobra and python. The serpent is the first totem phallic ancestral deity manifesting as the co-creator in her role as mother procreation. The celestial serpent is the first deity that ascended from the divine waters known as the goddess primordial form. India is given the recognition of the origins of the serpent worship, but it originated in Africa. Serpent worship can easily be traced to the early migration of serpent tribes as they travel from east to now what is known as West Africa. Serpent worship is an ancestral spiritual practice and culturally links to Indio, African, and afro dravidian cultures who travel from Fertile Crescent in southern Libya they built the first civilizations throughout the ancient world. So you're seeing this first primordial being give birth to humanity. And a lot of you saying, how is that possible? How can a black woman give birth without having sex? How is that even possible? Is that possible? You know, uh, that, well... That's why I think they're depicted as half serpent or half fish. 
they went through a process called parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis is a is Greek. It's also a Greek word meaning virgin creation. Genesis creation. It is a natural form of asexual reproduction in which a growth and development of embryos occur without fertilization. In animals, parthenogenesis means development of an embryo from an unfertilized egg cell. In plants, part of the genesis is a component process of the uh, apomixis. Parthenogenesis occurs naturally in some plants, some invertebrate animal species, including nematodes, water fleas, some scorpions, aphids, some mites, bees, phasmidia, and par parasitic, parasitic wasp. And a few vertebrates such as fish, amphibians, reptiles, and very rarely birds. This type of reproduction has been induced artificially in a few species including fish and amphibians. So there is these first mothers. This is my opinion and doing the research on it. They could have possibly went through a process called parthenogenesis. That is why they are depicted as half serpents or half fish. That's why you're seeing that being injected there. They could have babies. They could reproduce. They were asexual without male deity. The male deity didn't come along until later. So we're saying, you're probably saying, well, what happened? Well, we're going to dive into what happened. The first division of the man and the woman happened in Egypt, the major art culture had problems first in Egypt. So let's just dive in and kind of see what happened there. Okay. The powerful priests of Amon and Kam clans of Horus were the first to assault the matriarchal system. They began changing and violating the holy temples of the matriarchs, starting at Thebes. The priests took control of the sacred order of the matriarchs and began renaming many of the sun temples in Egypt. These priests totally removed the Miami goddess worship as the original head Pathanon spiritual practices and inserted their own. The original wars of the Titans and Giants in truth were the eternal political celestial wars between African priests and the Miami Sibyls. The new gods replaced the ancient gods. This is how the patriarch gods were born, depicting sun deities giving birth to goddesses. New creation stories were created, implying these gods being created from heads, thighs, ribs, saliva, or ejaculation. The Divine Mother was totally removed as the origin of the Patriarch Gods. This was a challenge since language did, didn't have pronouns to address men such as Mr., Mrs., Miss, Him, Her, or Lord. Many Matriarchs committed suicide strongly opposed to this change. Western Egyptologists and other historians have tended to focus on Egypt's dynam dynastic periods 2900 BCE during its patriarchal reign, disadvantageously limiting and diminishing the matriarch periods as they were merely transitional markers in preparing the way for the true power and divine rulership. However, before the joining of the two kingdoms, the lower kingdom is where the Miami water temples were viewed as Holy Vatican and seat of both sacerdotal economic and political power for the, of the, for the Queen Mothers. So you remember me talking about that in the last video? 
there was some struggles between the lower and upper Egypt. And I believe that lower Egypt was the Miami Wata matriarchs. That's where they held uh, their power at. And we're seeing it said here. These temples existed all throughout Africa and throughout India and the Mediterranean world. These queen mothers and priestess soon joined their exiled sisters in establishing powerful and flourishing kingdoms that would soon rival the older ones in Egypt, Ethiopia, and Libya. Namely, the forced joining of Upper and Lower Egypt was by King Menes, and the great exodus of the Amiamis, whose shrines were invaded by the sacerdotal political power observed by a fraction of the priests from the temple of Amun. So many of the sibyls left when all of this was done. So that's where you see a lot of migrating begin to happen when this divide happened in ancient Egypt. This will get more interesting and you'll understand more as we move on in this book review. As a consequence, Asia Minor, Massinea, Argos, Iona became a refuge for many of these matriarchal clans who reorganized and resurrected themselves as Sibyls. All right, so you're going to be, you'll see them called oracles. You'll uh, see them being called Sibyls as well. Do know that they're called, talking about these African ancestral mothers who left ancient Egypt. The sacred kingships were later introduced. The kings could only derive their divine legitimacy from claiming descent directly from a queen Sibyl, priestess of divine African serpent mother. So some of them stay too you know, and that goes back to the book, uh, The Destruction of Black Civilization, because he said a lot of these women were being kidnapped, too. So a lot of people knew that the only way they can establish their kingship is through these women. So they were being kidnapped as well when they were exiled out of Egypt. A lot of things went on when you start really getting into the ancient history and tracking history. You'll see a lot of things went on. When the priest of Amon seized all the major Miami seas temples, it enhanced their political and economic power, influence throughout the world, and began a new era of African patriarchal world domination and military conquest. So the men have finally overthrew the women, taken over some of their power as well when this happened. Now we're going to dive into the India and Asia influence as these ancestral mothers begin to move around. They begin to develop civilizations when this happened. During ancient times, the kings, priests, and priestesses of ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Ethiopia were considered gods who claimed direct descent from one or more of the seven Nagas in ancient India prior to the invasion by the Aryans. All of the major black Tamil gods such as Shiva and Buddha were worshipped as the king of serpents in the sacred Miami Mami, Mami Wata temples of ancient Egypt. They are shown being nursed by a great Nagas in the form of a woman possessing the head of a serpent. So you seeing these women go to India and Asia and telling their story of creation. Again, they created more spiritual systems. So when you look at Shiva, you look at Buddha, you're looking at Hinduism, when you look at those systems, they are coming from those ancestral mothers. African indigenous matriarch tribes lived in the Far East in ancient times. There are linguistic and cultural links present in the Asian and Indian culture. Japanese historians Historian Kifor says Buddha was an Egyptian priest driven out of Egypt, which is an indication 
Buddha was a descendant of a matriarch system that were later replaced by the new system of patriarchs adopted by the Egyptians during the birth of the pharaonic, pharaonic order. Buddhas were worshipped as the king of serpents in the sacred Miami Water temples of ancient Egypt who were depicted being nursed by great Naga in the form of a woman possessing the head of a serpent. So you see and this happened in Egypt as well. The Naga deity was worshipped in Lower Egypt. This is probably a strong reason why Lower and Upper Egypt were in dispute with each other. Buddhism appeared in the 6th century BC. It was popular in the India region. The word Buddha is a title believed derived from the word Oboda. Another ancient name for Buddha is Sosatia, meaning Savior. The statue of Buddha has Afro and Negroid features wearing a cloth on the right arm is an Akan African culture practice. Buddha was known as the ninth avatar, the first animation, and the original phoenix of the divine power to the triune of God wisdom. Buddha mythology can be found in ancient Ipsamabal in ancient Nubia, being the divine incarnation of the son Buddha, was spoken of by the Sibyls, written in the Bhagavad Gita. It is highly possible that it was the Sibyls, along with the chief priests of Amun-Ra, known as the Protopapas, that gave birth to this Buddha spirit during a sacred initiation. Buddha may have been venerated as a close ancestor named, known as Bacchus, Dionysus, or Menu. It is important to point out here that many of the gods and goddesses in African spirituality were actually ancestors that once lived. Ancestors that have passed on are elevated to godhood through rituals by their descendants. The concept of Buddhism is a thousand years old. It shares the same proponents of the Egypto Nubians yoga meditation karma reincarnation ancestors honoring originated from Hinduism. The Tibetan the Tibetan women attire can be traced back to that Sante people in Ghana. There is a modern evidence of an African tribe leaving its culture and fashion among the Buddhist priests of Tibet. These priests wore the outer clothes over their shirts across their shoulders just as the ancient Akan males wore their, theirs and modern Akan males still wear their clothing in West Africa. Despite the obvious African physical features of the image of Buddha who would believe in the West that the African name Oboda, meaning creator of the day, could be the origin of the name Buddha. Buddhism is said to originate in India among the sun joy, the aboriginal population linked to the Sindhanese and the Egyptians. Hindu gods and Egyptian gods have very strong similarities. Egyptian motif motives insinuate there was some contact between India and Egypt during the Indus Valley period. In ancient India, there are grand Umfe temples. We'll learn more about the Umfe as we move on. But you see that these women are going to India, they're going into Asia, and they are creating these spiritual systems. They are re re resurrecting temples. So they're just migrating everywhere. Despite being exiled out of their homeland, they're moving on. So now we're going to talk about their influence in America. And I know many of you saying, they can't, there, there was a major art culture in America. Yeah, there was a major art culture in America. Well, we're going to be talking about the Americas, the mound builders. And a lot of people don't know this information, but this is in my book, Matriarch the Patriarch. She talks a little bit about the mound builders, too, in her book as well. But 
if you're interested in more about that, you can get my book as well. I'll leave some link and resources at the end of this video. All right, so let's dive into the Americas that, you know, Mama Wata America's influence. All right, the Europeans were well aware of the ancient empire of, of the mound builders. The aboriginal ancestors could possibly be way older than the ancestors of ancient Egypt. The Spanish and the French historical records are filled with reports of highly civilized civilized agriculture society here in the Americas. Ancient ancestral mothers gave birth to the civilizations. They are the original owners of all the land from the Atlantic, South, and North America, Canada, Canada Gulf of Mexico, East, West, and the Flor Florida's, which is domain of the Wichita Empire and the landmass of 30 million acres so when these ancestral women start to move on because they were gatherers okay they used the land to do a lot of planting you know they planted all the corn they would plant the squash so many of them were really big plant either eaters and so and they were you know gatherers they did a lot of agriculture historical records show the extensive trading in one region the u.s tried to claim the americas known as the louisiana purchase abraham lincoln called it little egypt so they called uh, the, Louis, the the land of the Louisiana Purchase, Little Egypt. So they were well aware of this pre-Columbian civilization that was there, and the mounds were are connected with the with the ancestral mothers. And it's interesting as we go on, just looking at the mounds, we found out so much juicy information about what they really are. According to the Arthur of Adventures of Esplendian states, know that the right hand of the Indies are in there in the island of California is a terrestrial paradise which is inhabited by black women without a single man among them, and they lived in the manner of the Amazons. They were robust of body with strong passion of hearts and great value so they were well aware that there was a major art culture over here in the Americas very ancient culture and they also referred to them as the ancient ones yes because they they were the first they were the first one that migrated out of Egypt all right and they came here to the Americas sacred mounds and rock or stone was known by the ancient Africans as Umfe. And I know a lot of you haven't heard that. You've seen the pyramids over there and you say to yourself, oh, these are pyramids. How were they built? But before they were pyramids, they were Umfe's. They were Umfe's and they were later changed by the patriarchs to mimic a so-called phallic. But they were first Umfe, and some of you are saying, what is an Umfe? What exactly is an Umfe? Well, let's dive in. Sacred Mound in Rock and Stone was known by the Africans as Umfe, or Oracle, meaning the voice of speech of a deity. It is also known as the Umfeel, the emblematus of the world, the seat of divine influence, and the Ark of God. The emphasis Umfe, all the derivations of the sacred so-called Hindu mantra, Om. So the word Om comes from the word Umfe. That's where it comes from, which was originally the chant for Miami water. But under patriarchy came to be associated exclusively with Om or Amon, the beneficent African sunfire deity. The Umfe is the holy place of the sacred womb. So before you had the pyramid, you had the Umfe, the holy cervix, the holy womb. That's what you had. You had the Umfe that housed the spirit of the high deity such as Miami Wati or a clan, elevated ancestor who transcended the mundane laws of humans. In Africa, the Umfe was the first prototype for all sacred mounds of 
sacred mounds of earth that was built to house their deities. All of the Umfes across the world were originally dedicated to Miami water and linked in loose confederation of the holy shrines so these mounds that you see here today in the americas they were um phase they are evidence of a matriarch culture i know some of you did not know that some of you did not know that now let's look at the the let's look at these mounds and look at the um phase. look at that look how similar they are You'll see these cone shapes, you know, and I I'm firmly believe that that's what the pyramids were. They were in phase and they were later constructed the way they are now. That's just my opinion. That's just my opinion. All right. Now, let's dive into Islam. We're finished there. And like I said, I'm not even scratching the surface of, of the information that's in this Mama Wata book. I'm not even scratching the surface because there's so much information. I'm just doing a general, you know, just a general uh, review of the book. But it's so much more in there. It's so much more in the book. Now, Islam, it was pre mohammedian Jacoons, a guy named Jacoons or Jacons, who violated the ancient Miami goddess practice in Sudan, overland them with the unreasonable and oppressive patriarch structure. Later, Islam was born and founded by Muhammad. Islamists have waged constant campaigns to oppress and enslave older African traditionalists, emphasized on Sudan and Algeria where Africans were still being sold into chattel slavery. The ritual of sacrifice in Islam from the Holy Quran origins are the ancient matriarchs called Korah, Ceres, or Korites, who are survivors of the older African matriarch who had a spiritual system similar to the African-American hoodoo spiritual practices. Islamic Tugalis often serve their ancestors in Allah. Although Muslims have matriarch roots practiced under Miami deity al Azza or Awasa and Alat later masculinized to Allah, Islam in many parts of Africa still maintains the remnants of its ancient matriarchal past. Most Islamists do not separate themselves from, from Miami Wata or Voodoo practitioners. So you see it here, the goddess Alat. Before there was a Allah, there was a Alat, the triple-headed goddess. Samiris, Samirimus, you know, the crescent moon on her head. And that, you can also see that symbol in Islam. So she was a lot first. And again, they just built on top of the old Pantheon, the matriarch Pantheon. They didn't come up with these things. African women did. And the, the patriarch built on top of them. All right. So let's move on here. We're going to talk about the Jewish influence. And this is really juicy because... When you have this information and you look in your Bible, you'll see why they're saying the things that they're saying. Uh, like I said, this is a juicy book. All right. So let's dive in and look at the Jewish influence. The Achan people that these people left behind in ancient Egypt called themselves the people of Exodus, Ephraim people. And the people of Exodus called themselves Ephraim people. Linguistically, Ephraim can be traced to the Achan people. Ephraim means to break away. Later, orthographically transposed to Ephraim. So now they're calling themselves Ephraim, which is E P H R A I M. But they was Ephraim, A F R I M. 
It is evidence that these words have common root origin. Now, who is who are the Jews? Who exactly are the Jews? Because a lot of people say, too, that the original Hebrews, the original Jews are black. And they are right. Because once you read the book, the Africans who wrote the Bible you'll understand that they do have African origins. But how did they turn white is, is a brand new story. But let's stick with them, the ancient Jews. Let's look at more who the ancient Jews are and where they came from. That's the most important thing because they go on later to write this Bible for the Catholics, for the Christians. They are the ones, these Afram, ancient Jews, African men wrote this Bible for the Christians. All right, so let's dive in here. The Jews are 57 clans who broke away from the female goddess now claiming that the Bible is their story of ancestral fathers in ancient times. The Jews known by the name by an Achan, Achan name, Ephraim, English spelling is now Ephraim, one of the major tribes, supposedly Levites. They were heavily influenced by the Aryans that expressed strong patriarchal views. The biblical accounts say they came from Ur and not Egypt. However, history tells that Achan tribes were the creators of Egyptian civilization. So you see them in the Bible trying to get themselves out of Egypt. But then when you look at their history, they created, you know, their ancestors created the Egyptian civilization. So they're still linked to their ancestral mothers, even though they're saying they're not from there, that, you know, their culture links still link them to the ancestral mothers. All right. The Jewish people carefully inserted the marrying of patriarchs to the Egyptian Achan and Dejas matriarch tribal women. Now you see in there, you see these Jews, they're steady marrying these Egyptian, these Ethiopians, these dark-skinned women. Where these women were sibyls, they were prophetess. And this is why they were marrying them in the Bible. When you look at Hagar and you go back and see who Moses married, they are marrying sibyls. That is what's going on there. All right, and I bet a bunch of you didn't know, know that. The insertion gives clues of how the Jewish people came to adopt an African religion as their own and copied their ancestral mothers. Abraham married Hagar, who gave birth to Ishmael. Jewish scholars wrote their history around the Achan matriarch tribal scribes early history. The Old Testament is the story of the Jewish people weaved around the religion. The Jewish people claim they had a personal relationship with God. Yet in the Bible we read God does not speak to them directly. The true reason for this insertion is the feminine deity was angry with these people. All right, because they could they could no longer talk to my army Wati. They couldn't talk to her. They lost when they lost contact with their ancestral mothers. That made their God angry with them. And why you remember when Moses they got sick and they had to look in the serpent eyes? That's what that was all about. You heard me mention that in the Orisha video. It takes a trained Egyptian priestess priest like Moses to meet with this God because he was trained in the spiritual arts of his ancestral mothers. He most likely was claimed to be a priest of Amon. Truthfully, though, because you find this out in the Mama Wata book, which blow me away when I found this out. Truthfully, Moses was actually a woman who was a prophetess, priestess, Sybil. The Jews changed the story and made her a man to set up their religion. Many of these priests or pharaohs received their royalty through their mothers. This was the first establishment of, of the patriarchs. Nazarethos and Decalon, which the Christians would later masculinize and revise as Noah, was Onesis, that was considered the most highest divine ancestor of the African people. So what you're seeing, they're calling Noah was actually a sibyl called Onesis. She was known as 
and celebrated by many names having saved them from the great flood. Before the masculinization of Onassis, she was originally paired with a consort whose name was Dagon. Isn't that interesting? This was probably originally symbolized as divine twins, either as brother and sister or cosmo cosmologically as the moon goddess and her solar son Melchorsor, or perhaps in her generative generative and nurturing form of divine African mother Isis of Amawu, nursing her solar child. All right, we're getting ready to wrap it up. Like I said, I didn't want this uh, this book review to be that long, but like I said, I have not even uh, scratched the surface. I'm just talking about little highlights in the book, but there is even more in the book. Let's talk a little bit about the Catholic Church here. And there, you know, the matriarch influence on them because they took over the matriarch temples and they built on top of them and now you have the Vatican. So what I'm saying here is where you see the temple where the Vatican is now, that's where the black woman temples were. That's what I'm telling you. All these Catholic, these big Catholic temples and churches you see, they were once ran by the African divine mother of humanity. All right, that's what I'm telling you. So let's dive in here. During the 5th century, Harpolo acknowledges ancient Egyptian matriarch origins of all religions. This was a threat to the church. Harpolo inspired other scholars to research ancient Egypt. The Catholic Church and its revisionist writers has always monopolized on the African priestess and led the destruction of their mystery temples and schools and libraries. The Roman government felt it was imperative to abolish the mysteries of the matriarchs that control religious minds in the ancient world. The new religion replaced the mysteries of the matriarchs. It was equally powerful and universal and everything possible was done to promote its interest. The design and organization of the Catholic Church was based upon the ancient Egyptian hierarchy of kingship that was taken from the African matriarchs. The name Pope and most of their cultural practices of installing a new Pope were were well derived from the ancient Achaean practices of kingship in ancient Egypt. For example, the Pope was derived from the Achaean word Papa, a venerable name for an elderly Achaean male. Now, in conclusion, the goal of the patriarchal was to subdue the African woman, Ma'ami Wata, pull down her altars, cut down her groves, burn her images, and blot out her name under the heavens. Because that's basically what they did. There is no remnants of her. Not even in history. They don't even discuss her. Now, a lot of this information you can find through archaeological, you know, study. If you want to find more about major arcs, you'll have to do a lot of, you'll see it more in ar archaeological study than anything, archaeological history. You'll see it a lot more there than you would see in history. All right. So if you're looking for you want to do an independent study on it, you can look through archaeological history because that's where I found most of my information. Thus, they buried the history of the African divine mother and darkened and obscured her name so that her spiritual predominance would never again rise or be remembered. During this period, all African religions and their mystery schools were suppressed, their books destroyed, and the Mamawata temples converted into churches. The people were intimidated and coerced into relying on, relying on the lies and the misinformation spewing from the papacy. Many naive Europeans filled with fear and superstition led the massive crusades of the Mamawata and Ishtar temples, believing that the world was coming to an end.
There they awaited the return of their savior, who they knew was predicted by the Sybils to reincarnate as the 10th Avatar. Alright, so I hope you enjoyed this book review. I hope it was insightful. I appreciate you being here with me today. And I do recommend that you go out and, and get that book. It it's going to be very valuable to you. You can also get my book as well. It's research on the books that I've written and a lot of more research that I've done on my own. But thank you for being here today with me. Light and love. May the ancestors be with you.